Good morning and welcome, Sarah. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Sure. For the record, uh, Sarah Robinson, Deputy Director at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. And thank you so much for the invitation to provide testimony on H183 today. Um, and largely, we very much support this bill, which seeks to address and improve Vermont system of response to sexual violence. And as you've heard from the lead sponsor of the bill um, and other witnesses already this morning, just wanted to provide some additional framing about sexual violence in Vermont. As uh, Representative Copeland Hans has outlined it, in the United States, approximately one out of uh, one in five women um, have experienced sexual assault and over one in three women have experienced other forms of sexual violence, such as sexual coercion or unwanted sexual conduct. And although national prevalence studies do indicate that women carry the greatest burden of sexual violence over their lifetimes, we very much know that men are also impacted by sexual violence. And here in Vermont, we're not exempt from those um, sobering statistics. In 2019, uh, around 1,500 individuals reached out to a Vermont Network member organization for assistance with some form of sexual violence. And one in 10 female students in Vermont report being physically forced to have sexual intercourse when they did uh, not want to. And students of color in Vermont are more likely than white students um, to have been forced to have sexual intercourse and LGBTQ students are more than three times as likely to be forced to have sexual intercourse compared to their heterosexual and cisgendered peers. So there's, uh, as you've already been speaking about, there's really four primary components of this bill and I'm just going to speak to each of them briefly. Uh, the first is updating and modernizing the consent statute. As understandings of sexual violence and our culture and its impacts have evolved over the past several decades, so too have definitions of consent. And H-183 proposes to really update and modernize Vermont's consent statute to kind of bring it up to um, evolving cultural mores around, around consent. And we feel like the language that's proposed in H-183 certainly more accurately capture situations involving drug facilitated sexual assault and um, clarifies that lack of verbal and physical resistance, previous dating relationship, uh, the manner of dress of the victim, all of those things do not consent, uh, do not constitute consent to sexual assault. It also updates the statute as it relates to individuals who are unable to consent to, uh, to sexual activity to, due to disability. And I would just note that of significance, um, Vermonters living with a disability are twice as likely as those without a disability to experience sexual or intimate partner violence. On the data reporting section, um, we do believe that these uh, general requirements in an annual report to the General Assembly will help support the legal system's response to sexual violence. And as has been mentioned, despite the high prevalence of sexual violence in our culture, Sexual assault remains an extremely underreported crime with nearly 80% of sexual assaults um, going unreported. And because of this, it's especially important that when a survivor does choose to report a sexual assault, which is a very weighty decision, um, that the legal system really provides a robust and reliable response. And so ensuring that this data is um, publicly and transparently available annually will assist in future reform efforts to better target systems improvements and understand how the legal system can best meet the needs um, of victims. Uh, the bill also includes funding to begin an expansion of forensic medical care um, to primary care or reproductive health care settings. And as Michelle noted, the Vermont Forensic Nursing Program um, is a statewide program. It trains and supports a cadre of over 100 nurses statewide. And those nurses provide specialized medical care and forensic evidence collection for child, adolescent, and adult victims of sexual assault and domestic violence. And a standardized evidence kit is used to collect um, and preserve that, that evidence. And just to give you a sense of um, what that looks like in 2020, 
uh, about 320 adults and 67 children were treated by one of these specialized um, forensic nurses in Vermont. But currently, this care is only available in hospital emergency department settings. So this expansion um, will help ensure that additional victims and survivors are able to access this care in familiar settings with trusted providers and that that care is really integrated with their broader healthcare needs. And finally, on um, the Intercollegiate Sexual Violence Prevention Council, the establishment of such a council was a key recommendation of the Legislative Task Force on Campus Sexual Harm. And I did um, submit to the committee the final report of that um, very time-limited legislative task force that did exist uh, several years ago. But this council will serve to really coordinate and innovate responses to sexual violence across campuses in Vermont. Um, and one in five fe female students and just over one in five transgender students are assaulted on college campuses. And sexual violence within these institutions are, is, is especially complex. And that really is due to issues related to student privacy, Title IX proceedings, and um, variable law enforcement involvement in campus sexual assaults. And so the Intercollegiate Sexual Violence Prevention Council that's proposed in the language uh, would ensure, would assist in really ensuring that these responses and prevention efforts on campuses across Vermont are coordinated and that resources and best practices are shared across large and small private and public institutions. Uh, the bill, as you'll see, includes a small appropriation for the network to staff the council when the um, Campus Sexual Harm Task Force discussed this recommendation. There were no um, there were no volunteers uh, raising their hands to staff this staff this council, and so we would we would gladly um, you know have a state agency or some other entity staff this council, but. Um, in the lack, lack of any other um, entity raising their hand to do so, uh, we are, we're happy to provide kind of the administrative and technical support for this body. Uh, that's it for me. And um, I'm not sure if you saw my four-year-old who was trying to hand me something during testimony, but um, hopefully it wasn't, wasn't too much of a distraction. No, no. <laughs> We love that. Or I love that, I should say. Great. Well, thank you for your, your testimony. Sarah, um, in terms of the appropriation for the uh, forensic nursing program, I mean, that is critically important. And I was, uh, and this committee has actually done work um, on that um, issue before. And is that um, being asked for anywhere else? Are you having that discussion elsewhere? Because I, uh, I would encourage you to, or, or we could certainly talk about it as a committee. Yes, it, um, it is not being asked for anywhere else, but um, we would very much be happy to fold that into other related appropriations requests that are being made. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, committee members, any questions for Sarah? Coach. Great. So on, on the uh, appropriations, um, uh, question um, would that fall within our recommended uh, jurisdiction from a policy perspective uh, looking at Ken and I I know Barbara's in a probes right now but I I think we can make a very good case for it. it's very consistent with um, what we've done before and you know in the work in terms of the uh, the kits remember we did quite a bit yep Yep. Uh, work on the kits and um, and the nurses and and also uh, I think in the uh, COVID uh, budget that uh, funds that we worked on, so so certainly I okay yeah, yeah. thank you yeah thank you thanks Sarah thank you uh, Michelle and, and thank the little one too <laughs> well though I just um, wanted to mention if you are interested in just you know going upstairs to pitch the 40,000 for the forensic nurse program. I can take that language out of 
H183, not, not remove it, but I can duplicate it just as a standalone if somebody from judiciary does want to go while uh, Approps is discussing the budget, if you wanted to make sure that it's in there as well, just let me know, I'm happy to do that. Okay, great, I appreciate that. I know Barbara, um, this afternoon, um, Barbara um, and Ken will be, will be discussing uh, you know, various appropriation requests. Barbara is, is there now um, listening to testimony, so. Um, but I just, uh, you know, depending upon what happens with this bill, I don't, I don't want to lose sight of that. So, uh, possible. Great. Uh, are there questions for, for Sarah? No. Okay, great. Oh, uh, Bob, was that, are you waving goodbye or do you have a question? <laughs> no, I have a question actually. Okay. All right, great. And then Ken, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. I'm, I'm looking at uh, <clears throat> your testimony and, and the, the documents you've submitted. Are your statistics in those documents someplace as far as certain groups of individuals? Yes, I will. Um, I will submit those uh, those right now to the committee assistant. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, uh, Ken. Hi, Sarah. I assume a private university or college may have serious reservation um, taking up more more of this on their campus for lack of better words I, I I don't know what words I I want to say on this but that freeze Yeah, you did. Uh, do you hear anything? Uh, now I do. But if you, if you could, uh, can we state your question, please? Because you did freeze up. I would assume that private universities and um, colleges probably will be reluctant to take up more of. Uh, or to monitor this situation more closely, is is that maybe a fair statement? No, I really think that uh, that varies across institution and how institutions um, take this up. I I wouldn't necessarily, you know, in my experience, I wouldn't necessarily. I don't think there is one particular way public versus private institutions take this up. I would say that all institutions of higher education have um, similar. Uh, requirements in terms of upholding the rights of their students to access education. And part of that is the Title IX process that um, is part of higher education across institutions, whether they be public or private. Um, so I, I don't necessarily see a distinction between um, the way that public versus private institutions take this up other than um, institutions that tend to be highly resourced um, are perhaps able to dedicate additional staff time and resources to this and um, institutions that don't have uh, as many resources. Um, there's often people wearing multiple hats that are addressing sexual violence. I guess I should re-say that. I guess the state college programs and stuff like that where they're under more, more um, watch of the, of, uh, of government, that's all. Uh, Coach. So was the uh, independent colleges, uh, uh, were they represented on your task force, um, that organization? Yes, they were. The previous task force, the independent colleges were represented. Great. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for, for Sarah? Nope. Okay, great. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay, we'll now turn to State's Attorney Rory Chivo. Here you are. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And uh, for the record, I'm Rory Chivo, the Washington County State's Attorney. It's great to be back with uh, the committee and nice to see some new faces and uh, some familiar faces too. Um, first, I want to start by saying uh, thank you to Representative Copenhagen for taking lead on uh, drafting what I think is an important update to Vermont's uh, sexual assault statutes. And 
uh, clarifying the definition of consent. I want to start by just noting that um, other speakers have talk, spoken to this well, but from a, the lens of a prosecutor, the type of cases we see now are radically different than the types of cases that were uh, believed to be out there or reported maybe 20 or 30 years ago when the statute was last revisited. Uh, the days of the rape myth, if you will, of it always being a woman and it being a stranger is hopefully long dispelled, at least in policy circles, if not the general public. In Washington County in the last two years, we have had victims that are female, male, who are non-binary, who are straight, gay, who are young, old. Our oldest victim was 84 years old. Youngest, unfortunately, was three years old. We have Latinx victims, black victims, white victims. Sexual assault is pervasive across every socioeconomic group and every discernible demographic group you could possibly have. So much as how we look at sex assault has changed, the types of cases we're seeing are also diversified and broader and representative of who we are as Vermonters. I am in support of the changes here. And as a matter of background, many of you know that uh, prior to coming back to Vermont, I was an active duty judge advocate in the United States Army. Uh, through that, I lived through what one could call the military sexual assault crisis. Um, it's faded from the front pages of headlines, but about 10, 10 to 12 years ago, uh, the, sex, the crisis of sex assault in military ranks was at the forefront of the United States Congress's uh, efforts and also uh, military leaders. In 2007, the modern federal statute defining, or redefining rather, sexual assault, abuse of sexual contact, among other offenses, was enacted by the United States Congress. Thereafter, the Uniform Code of Military Justice was updated in 2008, 2012, and 2016. Suffice to say, the definitions that are being adopted here with respect to substantial uh, impairment of an individual due to alcohol, among others, the definition for consent, closely mirrors the developments that have taken place when the federal system and military system modernized their statutes. So unlike other changes where Vermont has gone it alone or been blazing a trail, this is a case where we may be lagging a little bit behind some other jurisdictions. But that has its benefits. Uh, to answer some of the concerns raised um, by Rebecca Turner, um, I would disagree with her respectfully. Right now, our system is confusing because we often have to dig into case law and use jury instructions as a way of informing a jury of what they need to be deciding. It's leaving a lot of, it's putting a lot of pressure on defense counsel and on courts and prosecutors for that matter to make up these definitions and go. And that's part of the reason why there's so much litigation that does reach the appellate level because of the lack of, of clarity at times. Mm -hmm. Borrowing from a jurisdiction that has been using this for in excess of 10 years, such as the federal government is incredibly helpful. And I remind the committee that right now, if someone were to be charged federally, the standard we're talking about applies. So Vermonter, Vermonters already face or are subject to the standard if they are federally prosecuted. Likewise, our men and women in the National Guard, whether they are, when they're in a federalized status are subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice, meaning people right here in Vermont can be prosecuted under these standards and definitions. So in that sense, there's really not much revolutionary here. I, I think that Michelle did an excellent job uh, adapting those definitions to Vermont's existing structure. As a matter of illustration, I wanna go through a recent case that we've charged under just the generic existing language of someone who was, someone who engaged in a sexual act with another person and compelled the other person to participate in the sexual act without the consent of that other person. So this is an active case, I'm not gonna use the names, but it was an acquaintance situation. There was alcohol involved and the complaining witness or victim, alleged victim in the case was at the point where she had vomited multiple times and was in and out of consciousness by her toilet. It's at that time that the alleged perpetrator came in, initially helped her and then decided that because of her perceived moaning that he, that he believed that to be an invitation to initiate sexual conduct. The definitions here under the circumstances of turning to page Turning to page three, specifically, no person shall engage in a sexual act with another person when the other person is incapable of consenting to the sexual act due to A, impairment by alcohol, drugs, or other intoxicants, and that condition is known or reasonably should be known by that person. 
taking that language in this example, under normal circumstances, a reasonable, rational, sober person would likely realize that this is not a person who is in a state to make a knowing and intelligent decision about whether to engage in sexual conduct. Even with the presence of alcohol, a reasonable person would probably recognize that that was not someone who was in a state to consent to a sexual act. The definition here does not so much, redefining this does not so much change the standard of what we already deal with, rather it sharpens its focus and it provides a clear and consistent definition that's not left to prosecutors, defense counsel, and courts to work out ad hoc in the middle of trials as they work through the jury instructions or jury charge. I think it's important to note is that nothing here changes the traditional defenses available to a defendant in a sexual assault situation, particularly mistake of fact as to consent. There can be any number of attendant circumstances that would suggest that someone did in fact have a reasonable belief that the person that they engaged in an act with did in fact consent to it. Uh, so nothing here in terms of refocusing or redefine or providing a better definition changes the availability of those defenses. Uh, so in that extent, I do respectfully disagree with uh, Ms. Turner's characterization that this uh, is expanding drastically the scope of cases that could come in. To that end, I, I think it's important to note that this committee has done outstanding work in the past few years in terms of criminal justice reform. A lot of that has been offender focused in terms of modernizing the correction system, changing how prosecutors uh, make assessments of what cases do or do not go to diversion. But when it comes to other crimes and serious crimes such as this, it's not a zero sum game of victims rights versus offender rights. Rather, we all benefit from a modernization and standardization of language in statute. It benefits Vermonters to have a clear and consistent definition of consent and a standard that's consistent with our federal partners, meaning there's not going to be two standards of what consent is or is not in the state, rather it's one standard. So to that end, I think there are great benefits in adopting uh, the language as drafted. And I think we can look favorably to federal jurisdictions and military jurisdictions that have successfully used this. It's a matter of reference in my uh, military background, I was both a prosecutor and a defense counsel. Uh, I have, uh, I won cases under these standards. I lost cases under these standards, both as a prosecutor and defense counsel. What I can say with great confidence is this, our jurors are intelligent, deliberate, contemplative, and dedicated to the public service that they're called upon to do. Facts are what decide these cases more often than the technical legal definitions. But that said, a clear and precise set of legal standards will only help those jurors make the best decision possible based on those facts. The final point I would like to make is, it's also important to note when discussing uh, racial disparities and justice, that those same disparities can apply to victims. Victims could come from all different types of backgrounds and the particular barriers for victims from different subsets of our, our state's population can be different. There are different barriers for someone who is a college student who goes to school with someone every day. There is a different barrier for someone who does not have English as a first language. There's a different barrier for someone who is sexually assaulted in a domestic or partnership situation. So it's incumbent upon us to ensure that there are multiple paths for people to come forward and also have confidence in a clear and effective system to ensure that justice is done, whether that results in a criminal conviction or merely a comprehensive investigation. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Uh, seeing if we have any questions from the committee or Michelle. Yeah. Oh. Go to that... committee members first if they have questions. Thank you, Michelle. I'm not seeing any hands. So, so go ahead, Michelle. Um, oh, thanks, Roy. Uh, sorry. Actually, Selena does. I'm sorry. Michelle can jump in. I'm happy to go after that. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. I, don't, I don't mean to scoop anyway. I was just, um, thanks for that, Rory. I appreciate it. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the questions that Will and Bob had earlier around um, how you navigate the cases where you do have both the actor and the alleged victim uh, impaired to some degree with regard to, you know, with intoxicants and or, um, you have a situation where uh, 
maybe the actor has a disability that may affect their ability to assess whether or not there's really consent or not. So um, I thought maybe you could share some of your experience in that to help us understand a little more about that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll actually return to um, my military days of a lot of our cases were, you know, a military barracks isn't that dissimilar from a college campus in terms of you have a lot of 18 to 24 year olds. There's frequently a large amount of alcohol and a lot of blowing off steam uh, for some military sites when you come back from the field uh, on a college campus it's after an exam or maybe after a sporting event or, or something else. Uh, it was not uncommon to see situations where um, the alleged offender and the alleged victim were both under the influence of alcohol. That being said, that's where uh, it comes into play about what is or is not a reasonable mistake of fact. Uh, notwithstanding that someone else is impaired, there, I guess to put in this context, maybe to take a step back, um, the case law definition under both federal and military standards of what exactly is uh, impairment by alcohol or drugs or other intoxicants, uh, that's to the point where the person is incapable of consenting, that's a fairly high standard to get to. Um, and in practice, those cases would often turn on questions of whether someone merely had a blackout and couldn't recall certain events that happened versus them being actually passed out or not in a position or state to make such a determination. This is not just your garden variety of, you know, someone's drunk and acting loud. It's beyond that. It's, you know, to put it in sort of physical or graphic terms, when I think of the standard, I think of that young lady I described who is sort of curled up in a fetal position by a toilet after vomiting multiple times from excess alcohol use. It's not just somebody who's had, a, you know, two or three glasses of wine. You know, we make any number of other legal presumptions where people are still able to consent despite being under the influence of alcohol. Uh, if we were to, you know, go and say that, well, someone who's under the influence of alcohol can't be held accountable for their responsibilities and our whole DUI law structure would be upended in that sense because, you know, what normal rational person would want to get in a car and drive with a, you know, 0.25 BAC. Um, but that's not how it works. So I would hearken back and say that the attendant circumstances matter, uh, both in terms predominantly focused on what is the actual objective situation of that alleged victim and what facts and information were available to that person. In terms of if someone lacks the capacity or has other barriers to understanding that, uh, the law just den generally doesn't look favorably upon uh, cultural variations or differences between uh, what may be acceptable in, say, one country versus another. Rather, uh, it tends to be more neutral looking at what would someone else standing in that situation, what would a reasonable person, if you will, standing in that situation see. Uh, so again, with that example, seeing someone on the ground who's effectively nonverbal uh, and has drank alcohol to excess, um, that would generally, I think hopefully the members of the committee and those here today would not be an invitation or a suggestion that that person wanted to engage in sexual activity, rather um, the, pro probably the opposite that they need to abstain from, from such. Uh, all I can say uh, in addition to that is this, that every case that is, that is actually filed or charged uh, and we talked about this before that already there's a lower there's a low reporting rate versus the number of cases that occurs there's an even lower rate of cases that are accepted for prosecution and then there's still a lower rate that are actually prosecuted to a conviction along the way there is discretion and i think you can look that most prosecutors in the state of vermont are um, we're not rich in resources and we often have to make very difficult decisions up front about whether it is feasible or not that we can prevail by with proving a case beyond a reasonable doubt. So in that sense, the gatekeeping unto itself often does take into account those particularities of um, a offender's background, history, or mental uh, status at the time of an offense, and likewise, um, the status of that victim. At the end of the day, we make the best judgment we can about whether to proceed or not to proceed, and even you know, even the step further, even if those cases are brought, there's no guarantee of success at trial. And moreover, if there is a conviction, everything you just mentioned would likely be considered or should be considered by the court as evidence in mitigation in terms of rendering a sentence. And certainly the degree of risk for someone um, deliberately engaging in an act or you know, pre-planning or drugging someone may be different than a situation where um, a 
incapacitated individuals you know, taken advantage of. Um, so I, I hope that helps answer it. It's, it's something that um, there's an awful lot of both federal and military case law that deals with those questions. And uh, I'd encourage uh, stakeholders to you know, look at that uh, to get some further information as well. Thank you. Uh, Celine. Hello, sorry, I'm on the phone with the health department and so I'm gonna pass on my question. I apologize. Okay, all right, no worries, take care. Uh, okay, Any anybody else? Any other questions for Rory? Great. Thank you very much, Rory. It's good to see you. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you so much. Great to see all of you as well. And I'm sure Armino will have some other great information to share from our, our side. Okay, great. Thank you. And that is a great segue into Armenia Medic. Welcome so much to our committee. Okay. Great. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for allowing me uh, to testify. And uh, I will start. My name is Armina Medic, and I work as a victim's advocate in Chittenden County State's Attorney's Office. I've been in this role for 14 years, and six years ago, I was assigned to Kuzi. So on a daily basis, I work closely with survivors of sexual assaults and fear of being ostracized, judged, not being believed or retaliated against is often the reason why victims don't come forward. Even if they do come forward, they often feel self-doubt, blame, shame, and humiliation. Deciding to come forward, even though you are giving services, you are constantly reminded of it. It means that while you are going through it, the system, you will not have any privacy and that you will be re-traumatized by it. They often feel like they are the ones on trial since the defense often focuses on victim's behavior. If the victim survivor reports the assault, there is no guarantee that perpetrator is going to be held accountable. Because some of the cases don't meet the burden of proof and the state does not have enough evidence to go forward, the prosecutor and I have to make those dreading phone calls to survivors to let them know that the state will not be able to prosecute because of those reasons. In instance where the charges are brought against the perpetrator, victim survivors are um, faced by a constant reminder of having to relive the assault. And just because the charges are brought does not mean the case will end in conviction. Defense often in these cases uses as defense to attack the victim's credibility. He said, she said, because we all know these cases often happen behind closed doors and not to mention incapacitation, level of intoxication, lack of or spotty memory. Long process often leaves victims question if it was even worth reporting it. Even if the result is conviction, there's no guarantee that appeal won't happen. This bill will not solve all of the problems, but it will definitely clarify the law around the consent. It would validate the experiences of survivors that have not come forward and hopefully encourage the victims who were facing these challenges to come forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's nice to meet you. I don't think I've met you before. So, so Thank welcome you. again today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, committee members, any, any questions? I see. It. Okay, great. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative. Great. Thank you. Okay, so then we will end with uh, the League of Cities and Towns. So, great. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Yep. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, Gwen Zakoff, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Nice to see everyone. Um, I am so happy that I sat through all of that testimony. That was really insightful, and I'm happy that I um, sat through um, Chief uh, Chief of Montpelier's testimony and the commissioner as well, um, because it helps answer a bit of the questions that I had in relation to the bill. So um, VLCTs, you know, we're only testifying as it relates to municipalities. So we're, I, I, 
not to sound like a broken record, but we're going to focus on the, the data part of it, the data collection piece of it. Um, and I sort of, as I read the bill last night, I, I identified four sort of issues that we might have with it as written, but I think, um, again, listening to the commissioner's comments, they, they shed a little bit of light on some of the questions I had had. Um, the first being uh, is how, what vehicle uh, law enforcement officers and constables would be using to report this data, because right now um, there really isn't a standardized approach to how you would do that. It's not like um, something like that exists. Um, and that uh, also led into the um, question about the uh, record management system that DPS is um, pushing out right now that the commissioner had um, spoken to. And so if uh, it, it's from, if I understood the uh, testimony correctly, the, um, the data, man ma data management system would have the capabilities of bringing forth this information by whatever data sets they're collecting. Um, so that's great because it would be standardized and it would be sort of um, uh, a way where, you know, because the data is only as good as the data put into it, right? So if it's not standardized and if it's not coded the same way and if it's not, if you're not using the same language, um, it uh, uh, it doesn't it's not really helpful sometimes. So uh, the standardization of it is really 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 important. Um, and if the committee moves forward with the language as is and doesn't wait for um, the commissioner saying you know come back next year we might have these data sets that actually speak to the larger issues that you're trying to get out with the bill rather than just counting the number of cases. Um, it would be really helpful to have definitions of what constitutes a case, a quote unquote case, um, because it's not really clear, at least as written right now, what exactly law enforcement is supposed to, to report, like what, at what um, level um, a, a, call for, a call for service becomes a quote unquote case. Um, so those are the comments that, that, that we have. I think overall the the, we're, we're really excited about the data management system that's coming forth because everybody wants good data, everyone wants it standardized. Um, and um, uh, having this information is obviously um, helpful for everybody. So whether it's using the mandate as is now or waiting um, to have the bits of data that speak to the larger issue, I um, don't really have a comment on, but I think definitions and standardization are really important. Great, thank you. I appreciate it. That's that's helpful. And um, and government operations will also um, would be you know would be looking um, at this section really to um, you know their jurisdiction and would be taking more testimony. So, um, but that's helpful to just get um, initial reactions and, and questions. So thank you very much, um, committee members. Questions. people a minute. Okay, so that's the anybody. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. Thank Good to you. see you. Okay, great. All right. So um, actually, I'm going to, I, I do see that Chief Jen Morrison is here. I just want to make sure that um, if you're listening, uh, I just want to give you um, an opportunity to, to add anything. Uh, thank you, you Madam Chair. I don't, I okay. don't necessarily have anything to okay. offer. Uh, for the right. record, my name is Jennifer Morrison. Sorry about this. I'm moving my screen. Uh, my official title is the Executive Director of Policy Development for the Department of Public Safety. Uh, but I got my official title well after my email footer got built, which uh, introduces me as the Special Assistant to the Commissioner. Um, I did want to confirm what um, Ms. Zakoff said from VLCT that when the state police transition to Valcor, which is the CAT RMS system currently in use by approximately 45 municipal and uh, sheriff's agencies in the state, that that will be uh, a considerable step towards consistency, consistency in the uh, fields of data that are put in to the CAT RMS system, and therefore, of course, ensuring consistency to come out. One of the other um, things that is quite appealing about using Valcor as the CAT RMS system is that as 
areas become known that we want to take a deeper dive into or collect more data points on, we have a lot more uh, control to build fields of data as opposed to some of the much larger vendors where even just to create, say, a drop down with new choices to select a, a condition or a circumstance code could take six months and thousands of dollars in programming expenses. So when the legislature or other stakeholders indicate that there's an important data set to be collected, this system is much more nimble than, than the previous one or the current one that the, the state police are on. Um, so this will be a significant step forward to have the whole state on the same CAD RMS system. Uh, and I did also find all of the testimony enlightening. Um, and I applaud your very important work. I was also the director of the sex crimes unit in Chittenden County for many years. Um, and this is this is a really difficult area. And I really am delighted that you're near, um, bringing more clarity to the issue of consent, uh, not only as a law enforcement professional, but as the mother of two 20 something year old daughters and having heard many of the I, I believe uh, Representative Copeland Hans talked about the around the fire pit stories, and I can confirm that many of my children's contemporaries have shared some pretty hair raising stuff. So the, the work you're doing is super impactful. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. And I, I appreciate those comments. Well, thank you. Okay. Any questions, committee? Anything else? No. Okay, all right, well, great. Then I guess we will adjourn.